Writer Ben Elton and producer John Lloyd have come to the Somme to reflect on the setting for the final series. I've always been so interested in the First World War, and yet I've never been to the cemeteries. I mean, we've all seen the footage, you know, you know I've seen many a panning shot, as we're doing now. But until you actually stand amongst tens of thousands of crosses, each with a name on it, it's really... I had a grandfather fight on either side. Did you know my German grandfather no. got an iron cross? No. Yes, he got an iron cross, which actually is buried in England, because when, as uh, Jewish refugees, they escaped from Nazi Europe, uh, well, escaped, got out, um, <laughs> my granddad brought his iron cross with him. No. And my uh, grand, <laughs> grand, grandma, on discovering it, was horrified. You know, here we are, German accents. Iron Cross. <laughs> People might put two and two together. So she buried it in a garden in Hampstead. <laughs> what we discussed back in 88 when we were writing it was, was not... sort of not taking easy laughs at the expense of sort of m such mass heroism. And, um, you know, coming here today, <laughs> I'm very glad we didn't. By the time we got to Blackadder Goes Forth, We'd always said that more than anything, what we'd like to do would be to create a series that was very claustrophobic, where the five or six of us who were the performers were trapped in a space. And what better way to feel that notion of claustrophobia than in the trenches in the First World War? Hear the words I sing. War's a horrid thing. So I sing, sing, sing. <laughs> Ding-a-ling-a-ling. -a -ling. <laughs> it was a really peculiar and bold thing to try and make a comedy out of, but I think ultimately a very sympathetic and respectful one, even though we, the characters were absurd and, and moronic at times. It, was nev it never sort of um, disrespected their courage or their sacrifice, I think. Oh, I joined up straight away, sir. August the 4th, 1914. Oh, what a day that was. Myself and the rest of the fellows leapfrogging down to the Cambridge recruiting office and then playing tiddlywinks in the queue. We'd hammered Oxford's tiddlywinkers only the week before, and there we were, off to hammer the boss. And how are all the boys now? Oh, well, uh, Jocko and the Badger bought it at the first Ypres, unfortunately. What a shock, Dad. This awful policy of what were called the Pals Brigades, because in 1914 people joined up together, whole gangs, the pub would all march to the recruiting station, a cricket team or the, the Tiddlywinks team, yeah, as, as we yeah. said in Blackadder. And uh, they'd all go together and they'd all be put in the same, because the idea was they'll fight together, they'll fight for each other. And of course, this industrial war didn't really have a lot of time for people to fight for each other because people would be mown down in an instant. Gosh, yes, I. I suppose I'm the only one of the Trinity Tiddlers still alive. <laughs> Lummy, there's a thought, and not a jolly one. People don't stop making jokes because somebody who's killed just around the corner. In many ways, life, as people say, have actually been in fighting in real wars, life becomes very precious and pumped up. Baldrick, what are you doing out there? I'm carving something on this bullet, sir. What are you carving? I'm carving Baldrick, sir. <laughs> Why? It's a cunning plan, actually. Of course it is. You see, you know they say that somewhere there's a bullet with your name on it. Yes. Well, I thought if I owned the bullet with my name on it, I'd never get hit by it. One of the things that always strikes me about that last series is how isolated all the characters in it are. You're a bit cheesed off, sir. George, the day this war began, I was cheesed off. Within ten minutes of you turning up, I finished the cheese and moved on to the coffee and cigars. <laughs> the world weariness of Blackadder was something kind of extraordinary, it was something kind of beaten down. He was not necessarily going to win all the time and knew that he wasn't, which gave it a kind of darker edge, I thought. Baldrick finds his absolute apotheosis as the Tommy. You know, he can make the best of everything, he can turn things to his advantage, however ghastly it is, he can find a better puddle to go to. I believe that Baldrick is the key to Blackheader and the key to why it's popular, because he's the common man. We actually all identify with this poor downtrodden guy who's not respected by anybody. Even when he's supposed to be stupid, Baldrick's analysis of everything is simple but basically truthful. Are you looking forward to the big push? No, sir, I'm absolutely terrified. <laughs> 
the healthy humour of the honest Tommy. <laughs> I had the privilege of performing a part that represented the ordinary lives of the grandfathers of an awful lot of people in the country in which I live. But really, it was for them to imbue Baldrick with that notion rather than me. I was just a bloke who couldn't make coffee. Baldrick, fix us some coffee, will you? And try to make it taste slightly less like mud this time. Not easy, I'm afraid, Captain. Why is this? Because it is mud. In the original script, Ben had just written this line about Baldrick saying that he'd made the coffee out of mud. We ran out of coffee 13 months ago. So every time I've drunk your coffee since, I have in fact been drinking hot mud. And then in rehearsals, as was so often the case, someone said, well, shouldn't there be milk in the coffee? Well, saliva. And then there should be sugar. Which is? Dandruff. <laughs> and then I know this was Tim McInerney, very late in the week, he suddenly said, just for us, not because he thought it would go in the script, because we could always make it cappuccino. <laughs> Ah, cappuccino. <laughs> Have you got any of that, um, any of that brown stuff you sprinkle on the top? Well, I'm sure I could... No, <laughs> no. In the initial rehearsals, he wasn't even called Darling. He was called Captain Cartwright, which is kind of dull. I mean, I didn't really know who he was and couldn't get an angle on him. And I had this... Bizarre idea, really, that maybe there was something laughable about him that was teasable. And then it occurred to me, maybe a name, a really silly name. What's going on, darling? And suddenly this character was born out of nowhere just because of the name. You never mentioned this to me, sir? Well, we have to have some secrets, don't we, darling? <laughs> I mean, it's such a simple joke, calling someone darling, especially if he's such a bitter, nasty man. They call him darling. And the way that Stephen could come out, oh, darling, get, get a laugh every single time. Captain Darling? Funny name for a guy, isn't it? <laughs> Last person I called Darling was pregnant 20 seconds later. <laughs> and every time his name is mentioned, it's just like a knife in his heart twisting him around and his hatred and self-loathing and his self-denial is just getting more and more tortured. Just doing my job, Blackadder. Obeying orders. And, of course, having enormous fun into the bargain. <laughs> I mean, Darling and Blackadder are kind of the same, really. They're kind of lower middle class... You know, sort of semi-gentleman, but obviously, you know, one of them's managed to connive himself onto the staff, and, is, and the other one's, you know, bad-lucked into the trenches. You're a damn fine chap. Not a pin-pushing, desk-sucking, blotter-jotter like Darling here. <laughs> eh, Darling? No, sir. Oh, you're always so good at this. Oh, yes. Oddly enough, these feet are not the same feet that I used to play uh, General Melchett in, uh, in Blackadder. Uh, those were my early feet. I lost those feet, those two feet, in a card game to Keith Allen in 1992. So these are, these are my second pair of feet. Young people playing old people is very funny. Because I was in my 20s and I was playing a general, it was somehow funnier than if I'd been the right age to be a general, which I now am. And it had to be a 30-year-old playing a 60-year-old. If it had been a 60-year-old actor, it, wouldn't have, it, it would have been, been different. And it, wouldn't have been, it might have been funny, but in a different way. It wouldn't have worked the way Melchett worked. It's the, sort of, it's the authority of youth. Slightly red cheeks, I remember having, because he was constantly puffing and, and blowing. and ah, Constantly, I ah, it had in my head that he had piles, so that when I sat down... Oh! Ah, oh! Like that. All the time, these strange noises and um, bleats and bars and things. Hey! <laughs> it's an extraordinary gift to play a character who isn't afraid of no one, who is in supreme command. It was just a wonderfully sort of seamless, seamless. There was this feeling of, a, of an unstoppable train of a performance. Who is the judge, by the way? <laughs> I'm dead. <laughs> Seven five minutes. We can have a spot at lunch. The court is now in session. General Sir Anthony Cecil Hogmanay melted in the chair. And I remember about five or six years after Blackadder Thought, I was walking along the street and somebody shouted at me, You bastard pigging murderer. And I thought, Oh God, it's a loony. So I